I get to look a bit cooler than I am because my students help me out quite a bit. Malalele. My name is Katriana Tafalele, but I usually go by Kat, and I am a third year student studying Law and Arts, majoring in Pacific Studies and Sociology. And today I am here joined by a lovely panel who I will let them introduce themselves. Tenikoto Kokoresa Shodnoho. I have a background in politics, in gender studies, and in um, in communication. I've been in Aotearoa for going on seven years now, and I am currently teaching in both the sociology and gender studies programs. Mauri ora ki a koutou, no tūhoi aho, ko Tracy McIntosh tēnei. I'm a sociologist by training, I'm a professor of Indigenous Studies, and I teach in Wānanga o Waipapa, Māori Studies and Pacific Studies. And I teach particularly around critical, uh, contemporary Māori and Indigenous issues. Kia ora, ko David Maera tāko ingoa. I'm a senior lecturer here at the University of Auckland. I teach in Gender Studies, Sociology and Criminology. And like Carissa, I moved here from the United States almost 10 years ago, so creeping up on a decade. So today we're going to be talking about social justice issues in Aotearoa and how we can make a fair society. Tracy, could you touch up on that? Well, I'm really interested in about what are the conditions that you need to have a just society. You know, really looking, you know, I'm interested in justice systems, but to have a, just, a really just justice system, we need a just society first. Mm. So what are the conditions that we need to have in place, you know, about addressing things like poverty, about addressing racism, around addressing marginalisation. So it does, it does need a really sort of strong, deep, profound honesty to start looking at those issues and addressing them. Mm. It's really interesting you brought up honesty because when we think about a just, equitable society, it implies that there's inequality, mm. right? And a lot of times when we think about inequality, we only think about one side of the story, mm -hmm. those who don't have as much access to resources or those who are experiencing injustices, but we don't think about the other side as those people who are privileged mm. because there's another sector that's being stepped on. And so it's also important for us to think about how we examine those with privileges and get people who have different accesses, accesses of privilege to reflect on that privilege and think about giving it up. And how just because you have privilege in one area doesn't mean that you're privileged mm -hmm. in all areas. So admitting or acknowledging or thinking about the ways that you have privilege in some area of your life is important, but doesn't mean you can't also you know, talk about or um, seek redress or justice for those ways in which you don't have privilege in other areas of your life. And so I know one of the things we all talk about in our teaching and in our research is the ways that kind of penalties and privileges of social power intersect. And so you, we would never just talk about race or gender or class, but that those things all work together. And I think that's the point, that point around power and the way that power is exercised, both from those who are relatively powerless and from those who might be relatively powerful. So you know, you know that point of that every society has both burdens and rewards, but at the moment in Aotearoa, New Zealand, those burdens and those rewards are not, you know, they're not distributed evenly. Mm. Coming into my degree, I had no idea what power or any of the privileges you were just talking about, or what a just society was. And so when I came into so when I came into sociology, I came to understand all the underlying. Uh, factors that affect everyday life and so as a student coming into sociology or gender studies or criminology what other issues do you think would pop up? Well I think one of the things that we we try to do in all of the courses that we teach is to look at the ways that gender or class or sexuality or race or ethnicity or you know mm -hmm. poverty um, the, the way that all of these things are intersecting, but also the way that kind of power works to make itself look natural. And so we spend a lot of time thinking about how the ways that the world is designed, whether that's something as small as the apps that we use on our phone or as big as the criminal justice system, um, that all of those things are actually built by people making specific decisions and that they are produced and reproduced over time to benefit some people and not others or to bring some perspectives in and not others. And so we spend a lot of time in our classes looking at how do those ideas get 
get produced, how do they get reproduced, how do they um, give us certain kinds of values or ways of thinking about the world, so that once we can see how that works, we can see how to undo that or denaturalize that as well. Criminology, I think, is really significant, particularly at Auckland, we teach a real critical criminology. So it's not about how do you control problem populations, but really around very solution-led, really understanding the sort of the structural drivers uh, that lead to both the production and the reproduction of, uh, of offending and actually the reproduction and production of victims as well. So criminology, I think, is a really significant one, a great one to do with Pacific Studies, great one to do with Māori Studies. A lot of my work actually is in prisons. I actually also teach uh, within prison environments. And so I've drawn very strongly on um, my sort of that critical criminology approach to bring the voices of those who are incarcerated, many young, many as young as you, some of them younger than you, that sit within our prisons, um, to, so that we get that lived experience into the classroom so that we can really devise solutions that will have intergenerational impact. Yeah, in our disciplinary areas, we really try and emphasize compassion. So we want you to sharpen your minds, but to have a soft heart. And from that, when we say critical criminology, I think one of the things that we mean is that we criticize or scrutinize the different ways that criminal justice systems are built. Sometimes we say constructed, and we try and break that down to understand them in more simplified ways. And it's with the intention of creating or doing away with the criminal, creating a criminal justice system that is either more compassionate or doing away with it altogether. And so when we know that indigenous peoples globally, Maori and Aotearoa, also Pacific peoples in Aotearoa, are overrepresented at different stages in the criminal justice system, we're thinking about, well, why does that happen? How can we work with Maori and Pacific communities in order to reframe what a criminal justice system means or how we create a society without one? Mm -hmm. But these are all interconnected as well. So I'm thinking about a, a course that I have taught in the past and will be teaching again next year called Law, Inequality, and the State. Mm -hmm. And it brings together all of the things that both Tracy and David have just been talking about. You know, so when we're thinking about um, really approaching the way the criminal justice system comes to think about certain people or is constructed in such a way that certain identities get attached to people and then they become labeled as criminal. Or we, we look, for example, at domestic violence law and think about you know, the ways that it, it approaches men and women or relationships in particular kinds of ways that really disadvantage certain groups of people and, and turn these kind of um, personal struggles into criminal justice ones, which is not necessarily always the best way to, to approach that. What are, in your certain fields, um, majors that you'd suggest would go together? Oh, that's easy. Oh. If, I, if I'm coming from a gender studies perspective, you know, I, to, I wear a number of hats, mm. but I'll, I'll put on my gender studies <laughs> hat, and I would say every major goes with gender studies because there's nothing that you will study where gender studies won't provide a useful lens uh, or a useful way to think about it. Gender affects health and medicine, it affects mm -hmm. urban planning, it affects the way we study history, it affects the way we study economics, it affects leadership, it affects um, exercise and sports science, you know, whatever it is, um, literature, yeah, media and communication, their gender is just infused through all of that. You know, gender is, it's like the air that we breathe, it's everywhere, and because it is everywhere, we don't think about it, and yet it's so fundamental to how the world is, is structured. And so, whatever major you are interested in, gender studies is the perfect complement for that. You know, we have one course, um, which, uh, it's our Māori introduction to the Māori world. We have you know, about 500, about 800 a year do that course. The vast majority are not Māori, and I think it's because particularly young people now know it's really important to have a much broader view of what is the history of this country? Why are we where we are? Why are there so many negative social indicators that Māori are overrepresented in? What are the solutions? What can we do that's different? What contribution can we make to, you know, to create and change this space into a sort of sustainable future? So Māori studies, I think, again, is, is really important to do alongside a whole range of, uh, of you know, other majors. 
And it's certainly not just for Māori. And in fact, as I said, probably two thirds of our students are not Māori. My next question would be, what do you love about teaching? I love the aha moments, you know, that when something just clicks in the students. I teach a lot of theory classes, which is not usually, for most students, that's not their favorite thing. Like it's a little dense, it's a little abstract, um, but then we read it and we talk about it and then suddenly they'll be like, I get it. And they have these wonderful ways of expressing that, most of which that are coming to mind, I probably don't want to say on the video because they tend to involve some language. but. Um, <laughs> But it, it's just this really wonderful moment of seeing somebody see something new or see, see something they've always seen but seen in a new light or see it in a new way. And, and especially when, they, when the students come to you and they say, I feel really empowered now or I feel like I understand this and I never understood this before and now I know why I felt this way or now I can see what to do. And when somebody says, Basically, I've learned something and it's been meaningful to me and I can take this forward. And then you think, that's why I'm doing this. Yeah, yeah it's a real privilege to teach. And particularly because this is an adult learning environment, you know, so you're coming out of a school environment into an adult learning environment. And so, you know, that brings its own incredible opportunities, but really significant challenges as well in terms of that engagement. I guess the thing that I, I enjoy being in the class, I enjoy the, the just what happens within within the space of the class and learning. But it's wonderful also to see where our students go. Mm -hmm. um, and I've, I've, you know, I've got like, you know, like David, like Carissa, we have ongoing relationships with our students in terms of seeing where they are. So we've got students working, you know, in the non-government sort of sector. I've got students students working in really important areas around harm minimisation and, and uh, around violence minimisation. I've got others working in uh, government agencies, some of them even in Treasury, but you know others within uh, education and within uh, MSD and other, other types of agencies. So there's this real joy of just seeing where people go. Others often go for study elsewhere, including overseas, uh, out of COVID times, obviously. But, you know, so there's just something about seeing the contribution and recognising that they've got the skills and the talents far in excess of my own to really make an ongoing contribution in the world. And you know, so there's that really wonderful future element around uh, teaching within a university setting. Our final question for today, um, we'll start from David. And it is, what advice would you give to students who aren't too sure what they want to study here at uni? My first part of advice would be, don't worry about it. Coming to uni is a learning journey. I came into uni not knowing what I wanted to do, so I was a business major just because I thought that's what I'm supposed to do. But the best advice I got at the beginning of university was from somebody who said, use the first year, year and a half to find something that you're really passionate about and use the last half of your university to figure out how you can engage in that discipline and get paid for it afterwards. And so, um, yeah, don't stress out too much. Figure out what you love, major in that, or whatever those different majors are, and then think about making a career out of it later. The other thing I would suggest to students is that you think, okay, I'm acquiring all this knowledge, what am I doing it for? and it's in order to serve your community. Whoever your community is, it's when you leave here, it's about serving your community. How can you most effectively do that? Tracy? Take a risk. You know, so take something, if, if, if there's something you really loved at school, definitely take that as well. But one of the joys of the double major is that you can get to do things that you've not done before. So this is the time that you can take some risk. As I said, it's an adult learning environment. There is, that's, a, that's one of the wonderful elements of it. And there's this possibility of opening a new world up for you. So, so that's my sort of sense. You know, you, it's a, in some ways it's only three years for that degree, but you have got ways of moving and navigating through that. Find your voice, find your passion, and and do something different. I think David and Tracy covered it really well. I mean, I would also just say, take a chance. You know, there's the there's this image that's it's sort of circles within circles. And so in the smallest one, you have your comfort zone. And then in the middle one, you have your learning zone. And then in the outer one, you have the sort of the stress zone. It's not quite the right word for it, but that's basically the idea. And if you only stay in that comfort zone, 
you you aren't really learning. So learning means that you have to, you don't want to be so stressed out that you can't focus on anything, but you you do want to stretch your horizons and, and study something or take a chance on a class that maybe you hadn't thought about before. You don't know what it's about. And it might work out or it might not, but you will definitely learn something about yourself, if nothing else. And all of those courses that you take in that first year will in different ways inform how you think about what you end up majoring in later on. Um, and you may have one of those aha moments where you discover something you didn't even know existed and it becomes your life's passion. Cool, so uh, you heard it here. Don't worry about it. Take a risk and take a chance. Uh, my name is Kat. I was joined here by David, Tracy, and Garissa Malapito.